appreciate all your prayers. Would you take your Bibles, please, and open to the book of Luke chapter 18 tonight, Luke chapter 18, and uh, I want us to look at the first eight verses of this chapter, but I'll just read the first verse with you tonight, and Luke chapter 18, verse number one, and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint. Would you pray with me now? Father, thank you for your precious word. Lord, as we go into it tonight, Lord, give us understanding. Lord, help us to see things like the psalmist prayed. Lord, we pray tonight, open thou mine eyes that I might behold wonderful things out of your word. And Lord, may we apply truth to life, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. William Carey, uh, has one of the missionaries of times past, was known as the founder of modern missions. He had a man who had a great impact on England and, and India and the world for that matter. And you might not know that he was really a man who didn't really have a lot of formal education. He was simply a shoe cobbler that felt the burden to go and take the gospel to places where Christ had not been preached. And back in that day, uh, the, the place that the Lord laid on his heart was India. And he wanted to go there and translate the scriptures. And so this was a very difficult field uh, just to go there and staying there was tough, but year after year, he experienced overwhelming obstacles, incredible problems. I remember that one time I was given a biography of William Carey, written by Christian historian Timothy George. That's one of the few books that I, uh, I read from beginning to end without putting it down. Stayed up all night to read the book because I was so incredibly um, uh, stunned by all of the, the, the problems and the difficulties that William Carey had to persevere through an order for him to do what God called him to do. But by the end of his life, he established a mission station. He started churches. He translated the Scripture into several languages. And he really, he set in motion the modern missionary movement that we know of. And the impact of his life is still being felt today. And so he was asked one time, how in the midst of such adversity could he accomplish so much? And you know what his answer was? He said, I can plod. He said, I can persevere in any definite pursuit. He said, to this I owe everything. Few people know what may be done till they try and persevere in what they undertake. And so William Carey said the secret to his whole life wasn't really a secret. It's just persevering. It's just staying with it. It's just continuing on. And you know, that's a quality that all of us need in our Christian life life. We need to learn to persevere. We need to learn to endure. We need to learn to get tough when things are tough. It's like Vince Lombardi, that famous theologian. I'm only kidding. He was a football coach. He was a football coach, for those of you who don't know football. But he said, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, how tough are we? And how do we develop this perseverance that God wants us to have? Because let's face it, uh, many times in this life, we just simply have to persevere. Things are difficult. We live in a difficult world, and it's not friendly to Christians. It's not friendly to the church. And we look around, and we see all kind of injustices that take place, and it causes our hearts to sink. And so the question is, uh, how do we persevere in this unjust world, in this hostile world, and not lose heart? Well, the Lord was aware of this problem, of course, and this is one of the reasons why he addresses his disciples on this very issue. And that's the whole point of this parable here that we're going to look at here in Luke chapter 18. And there are actually three lessons that I want you to see tonight from this parable that I hope that you will get down into your heart. Here's the first lesson. If you're taking notes, write down the problem of losing heart. There's a problem. Look in chapter 18 and verse number 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Look at the word faint there. That comes from a Greek word, which is ek, kakeo, and it's a combination of two words, ek, which means out of, or to turn out. Uh, kakeo is actually the word that means bad. And so literally we could say to turn out bad. And the word came to mean to lose heart because things at times turn out bad. Uh, when things turn out bad, we have the tendency to get discouraged and want to quit. We want to lose heart. Have you ever lost heart? Have you ever had those thoughts? You know, what's the use of trying? I mean, I'm trying to do the best I can. I can't seem to make progress. Uh, things don't just seem to work out for me. 
again, we look out in this world and we see so many bad things, so many injustices, so much mistreatment. Maybe you're a believer here, and on your job you might face that because people know that you're a Christian, you live a life of integrity, moral integrity, honesty, and because of that, people attack you because of that very thing. Uh, Perhaps you're trying to find justice in the courts, and you don't get justice. Or perhaps you have a troubled marriage, and you're doing everything you can to make it work, but the other partner is just not cooperating. Or maybe you have a child that's a prodigal that is running out into this world, and they're not doing right. They've been swayed by the evil of this world. Or maybe you're just trying to work, and you just can't seem to make ends meet no matter what you do. It just doesn't seem to work out. And so you're trying to be faithful, but things are just not happening at your home, at your job, in your relationship, in your physical health. Maybe you're trying to be healthy and you got a bad report from the doctor or in your financial dealings. And you might be here tonight and you might be saying, you know what, I'm, I'm just ready to quit. I've lost heart. I'm going to throw in the towel. Well, if that's your attitude, this parable is for you. Because Jesus taught this parable for that very reason, to teach us not to lose heart but to persevere in the most difficult times. Now, the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves, and he knows the weakness of our heart. He knows that we're all prone to lose heart at times. And if we're honest, we all have to say that at some point in our life we've been there where we want to throw up our hands and we want to say, I've had enough. And so Jesus gives this parable to address this issue. And what I want you to see here, first of all, in the context, is that it comes immediately after the Lord's words on his second coming. Uh, In chapter 18, verse 1, it says, and he spake a parable. It's actually a continuation of a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples that really begins in uh, chapter 17, verse number 20. And in chapter 17, verse 20, uh, he is uh, fielding a question from the Pharisees And the Pharisees demand to know when the kingdom was coming. Look in chapter 17, verse 20. Just back up there so we can get the context of it. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. And uh, basically, Jesus was saying to the Pharisees, you're not going to be able to discern it. In fact, the kingdom of God is already here. It's already among you. Here they were talking to the king of the kingdom of God, and they weren't able to receive that or to to discern that. And we know in the Bible that the the Scripture says that Jesus came unto his own, and his own what? Received him not. They weren't ready to receive the kingdom at that time. And so the kingdom that Jesus was going to set up at that time was going to be a spiritual kingdom, and later he would come and set up his physical kingdom and reign from the throne of David in Jerusalem. But the time between his ascension... He'll finish his work on earth and his ascension to heaven, and the time between his ascension and his second coming would be a long time. And during that time, his people would be in a hostile world. And so uh, Jesus basically um, tells them that in the between time, the days are going to get difficult. Look in chapter 17, verse 22, and he said unto his disciples, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and shall not see it. That is, you'll want the kingdom to come. You'll want to see the Son of Man, and it's not coming. It just seems like every week I get a question from a believer, and they'll ask me, Dr. Harmon, when is Jesus going to come back? When is he going to return? As if I knew the answer to that question. Well, let me get out my calendar. He just told me the other day. It's going to be on this date. What did the Bible say? The day and the hour? Nobody knows. We, We just don't know. And so basically, We have to be patient, and we have to wait, and we have to persevere. And you know what? Things aren't going to be easy until the Lord comes. In fact, he gives after this, and we don't have time to look at it, but he gives after this two kind of illustrations of what it will be like before Jesus comes again. It will be like the days of Noah. What were the days of Noah like? Well, they were days of anarchy. There were days when men were filled with iniquity. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 5, and that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then Jesus said it will be like the days of Noah when, when people were basically filled with evil in their heart. And also it would be like the days of Lot, uh, Jesus says. And uh, what were the days of Lot like? You, will you remember the story in Genesis 19? 
of when Lot was the judge at the city gate at Sodom. And it'll be days like Sodom and Gomorrah, like all the evil and the wickedness that took place in those cities. And so it's going to be a difficult time but before the Lord returns. There's going to be all kinds of things that we have to deal with. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 3.1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. And Paul warns Timothy, Timothy, these dangerous times are going to come. And the world will grow more and more hostile in the last days as we wait for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and and by the way, look in chapter 18 at verse 8. This is at the end of the parable that Jesus gives. He asks a good question in verse 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? I mean, is there going to be anyone left that's going to be faithful when the Son of Man comes? Will he find faith on the earth? Will he find Christians persevering? Will he find Christians staying faithful and true? Is everyone going to quit? Is everyone just going to give up, throw up their hands, no longer be faithful to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, believer. Jesus is just as worthy of your worship and service as he was on the very first day that you were saved. In fact, he's more worthy of your, of your life. And so, in the intervening time between the ascension and the second coming, it's possible for many just to be overcome by all the things that they see and to lose heart. Remember the parable of the ten virgins Five were foolish, and they ran out of oil. They didn't bring enough oil. And the bridegroom delayed his coming, and they ran out of oil. Oil in that parable does not represent the Holy Spirit. Oil in that parable represents obedience, continual obedience to Jesus Christ until the bridegroom comes. And so the idea there in that parable is really parallel with the idea here. It's the idea of losing heart, running out of oil. You might be here tonight and say, I'm low on oil. Well, I hope that this parable will help you not to lose heart. Losing heart is motivated by weariness that comes from living in a sinful world, a world full of mistreatment, full of injustice, full of all kinds of sin, and we just feel like sometimes giving up and going with the flow. Don't ever do that as a child of God. So, There's the problem of losing heart, but I want you to write down number two, the parable about losing heart. With all that in mind, Jesus gives this parable of this destitute widow and her circumstances, and you know what? We're going to find out in this parable she didn't give up. Look in chapter 18, verse 2, saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest her by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. Now, there are several things in this parable I want you to look at. First of all, there's the character of the judge. And in this parable that Jesus gives us, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning, we are brought into the legal system of the Lord's time. It really introduces to us two people at the opposite ends of the legal spectrum. First, we have this judge. He's the epitome of power. He has, his position has invested him with total authority with regard to legal things. Within his own sphere, he can act with no opposition. And he has a sense of his own power. What's the old expression? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, this judge is kind of the illustration of that. Because notice in verse number two again, it says, he feared not God, neither regarded man. He is a hard-bitten man of the world. He has no sense of personal accountability to God. He has no submission to the divine law. None of those things are in his heart. He has no sensitivity to the plight of people. 
Now, the highest religious court in Israel was the great Sanhedrin that consisted of 71 judges. But under them was a lesser court. Each city had their own ruling body that consisted of 23 judges in each city. And the Jewish legal system, based on the Old Testament, called for priority to be given to especially widows and orphans. But this man is likely he's not a Jewish judge. In fact, the fact that he doesn't fear God is probably an indicator to us that he's not a Jewish judge. He's been assigned to this district either by Herod or by the Roman government. More than likely, he was a Rome-appointed local magistrate, and these men were paid large salaries out of the temple treasury. Even though they were not, even, not Jewish, they were Gentiles, they were still paid by uh, the temple treasury. And from Jesus' description, I think this was a Roman judge. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about the people there. And to, write, to, to quote what one person said, such judges were notorious. Unless the plaintiff had influence and money to bribe his way to a verdict, he had no hope of ever getting his case settled. And so these judges were said to pervert justice, some of them just for a simple meal, for a dish of meat. In fact, the people back then, officially they were called Dayane Girarot, excuse me, but they were, the, the people changed that. It was kind of a pun in the Aramaic to uh, Geraloth rather than rote, they changed the R to an L or the Raish to a Lamed. And basically it means, uh, the, the first expression means a judge of punishment, but they changed it to mean a robber, a thief. And that's what the people thought of these judges. They were notorious for their corruption. And so here is this man. He didn't care about justice. He didn't care about the poor. He didn't care about people. And he loved power. He loved money. He loved notoriety. And this is the judge in this story. But I want you to see, secondly, not only the character of the judge, but write down the cries of the widow. Look at verse 3. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. Now, this is the only other character in in this parable. It's this poor widow. Again, she's on the other side of the social spectrum, while on one hand, there's no one more powerful than a judge like this, there on, there's no one more helpless on this hand than a widow. The widow represents the depth of helplessness and weakness and oppression in that society back then. This, live, this woman is living in a chauvinistic society. She has zero political clout. Most widows in that day, they were impoverished. This is why we see so much in the New Testament about taking care of widows. The church is to take care of widows. There was no government programs for her to fall back on, no Social Security, no Medicare. The death of her husband left her with absolutely nothing. And she's been exploited. She's been a victim of the system. And in Palestine in that day, women did not even go to court. They didn't have the right to even go to court. She doesn't have a lawyer. And if she could find a lawyer, she couldn't afford him anyway. She has no public defender. She has no one to appeal to but this one corrupt judge. So she's a victim of injustice. She's a victim of oppression. And so she has an adversary. Someone has done her wrong, and she needs justice. She has no one to turn to for help. She has no, evidently no sons that can help her. She has no brother or brother-in-law, no cousin, no nephew, no distant male relative that could plead her cause for her. She has to do it herself. And this woman has every reason in her circumstances to lose heart, to just give up and throw up her hands and say, forget it. It's not going to happen. But she doesn't lose heart. She keeps coming to this judge again and again. Apparently, she's got a, a solid legal case. And she's not asking for special treatment. She's not asking for a favor. She just wants justice. And she's relentless. Look at verse number three where it says, she came. We could translate that like this. She came back again and again and again. And notice what her request is in verse number three, the end of the verse. Avenge me of mine adversary. Literally, vindicate me. Give me 
justice. She was seeking vindication for some injustice that had been done to her. And the judge's response is unbelievably cold. He simply refuses to hear her. He dismisses the case with extreme prejudice. He doesn't want to deal with her. He ignores her. He pretends she's not there. He just wouldn't pay attention to her. It was like talking to a wall, a brick wall. He was that hard. He would not hear this woman. And so most people in this situation, well, again, they would lose heart, but not this widow because this goes on for a long time. Look at verse number 4. And, she, and he would not for a while. The word while there is chronos, where the Greek word we get the word chronology or chronic. It means it's something that happens over a long period of time. When we say something is chronic, what are we saying? We're saying it's ceaseless, it's unabating, it's unending. And so this gives you the idea that this woman keeps coming back again and again and again. It just She just won't give up. And he got to the point where he was just worn down by her continual coming. She just would not give up. Recently, I read of a man, a Korean man named um, So, who finally, at 70 years old, passed his driver's test and was able to get his driver's license on his 272nd attempt. 272. Now, it made, reading an article made me wonder if they just simply passed the guy just to say, look, just, just, just pass him. I mean, you know, just give him the license or he's going to be coming back again and again and again. That's what it was like here. He was chronic, and that's the way it was with this woman. She just would not give up. She kept coming and coming and coming. But not only the character of the judge and the cries of the widow, but I want you to see, thirdly, the conclusion of the case. Finally, this corrupt judge has enough. She wears him out. Because look at the, uh, verse 4 where it says uh, again, But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, you know, he knew he was a wretch. He knew himself that he was a wretch. I don't fear God or regard man. And maybe what he's saying is when he sees her coming again. I can just almost hear him sigh. Oh, brother. There she is again. Though I fear not God nor regard man, yet this woman troubleth me, I will avenge her. Translation, she is such a pain in the neck. And he says here, lest by her continual coming she weary me. We could, again, translate the two words here in the Greek. It's ice teleos, to the end. In other words, her coming is endless. It's a a common expression that means forever. She's going to come forever. She's just not going to give up. And weary me, I love that expression there, weary me. She's wearing me out. In the Greek, it's a boxing term. You know what it means? It means to strike one with a blow, ready to knock them out. And that's what happens. This woman is literally ready to knock this judge out because she kept coming again and again. She's got him on the ropes, and this judge is ready to fall. And so her continual pleas were like fists hitting this unjust judge. She is painful to him. And remember, I call this a parable about losing heart. We do have someone in this parable that loses heart. It's not the woman. It's the judge. The judge is the one who quits. The judge is the one who says, I've had enough. I'm done, so let's just give this woman what she wants. And here the Lord is, again, teaching us a lesson about losing heart and about prayer. Now, how does the Lord use this story to encourage us? And that's what I want us to look at here in the next part of this parable. I want you to write down number three, not only the problem of losing heart and the parable of losing heart, but I want you to see number number three, the prevention of losing heart. And what Jesus is going to do here is give us a a great comparison um, here. Look what Jesus said down in verse number six. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. The Lord says, did you hear that? Did you hear what this unjust judge said? Look in verse number seven. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? If this 
unjust judge gave this woman justice, how much more will your heavenly Father give or answer your prayers to those that are his children? Now, Jesus here is using an argument or a device that was used by Jews, Jewish rabbis in his day. The argument is called uh, kol the uh, homer, or we could say from lighter to heavy, or from lesser to greater. This was a technique that was used by rabbis a lot of time when they were trying to argue a point or make a point. And the idea is this, and by the way, we see this used a lot in the, in the New Testament, for example. Remember when Jesus said, if God so feeds the sparrow, will he also not much more feed you? Are you not worth more than sparrows? That's the same argument, from the lesser to the greater. If God feeds the sparrows, you're his child. Don't you think God's going to feed you? That's the idea here behind this argument. If God so clothed the grass of the field and the flower, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith, from the lesser to the greater? Jesus is using the same kind of argument here. He's basically saying, look, if this destitute widow and her circumstances did not lose heart, then why should you? Why should you lose heart? Our circumstances are nowhere near as bad as hers. You say, how do we know? Because of what Jesus is doing in this parable, he's making a purposeful contrast between an unjust, evil judge and a wonderful, holy, heavenly father. And so let's look at the lessons that he wants to give here. First of all, what we see is a lesson about God. He's teaching us here a lesson about God. This intended contrast is to show that the fact that we have a Father that loves us, a great heavenly Father, that should cause us to never lose heart about bringing things to him in prayer. If the unjust uh, judge gave this woman what she wanted, how much more will God give you what you need? Our God is not an unjust judge. Our God is a gracious Father. Our God is a loving and good God. And how much more should we not lose heart and bring our case to our Heavenly Father. Jesus wants you to understand your Heavenly Father is nothing like this unjust judge. He doesn't need to be nagged or manipulated. Unlike this judge, he cares very deeply about your circumstance. He cares very deeply about your plight. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of God's willingness. And that's what Jesus wants us to know. Listen to Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous of mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. Isn't that a great verse, great passage? And so that's what our Heavenly Father is like. Look, go, go back to Luke chapter 11. Look in verse number 10 real quick. Let me just show you a few verses here. Look at Luke 11, verse 10. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he, give him, will he, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You get the point there. If our children come to us and they have a need, we wouldn't do something so cruel as to play a joke on them. If they ask for bread, we wouldn't say, son, I don't have bread, but I have a stone here that looks like bread. Here, you, here chew on this. No earthly father would do that. Or if he asked for a fish, give him a serpent. Some, some fish, some serpents look like fish and fish like serpents And in and, and that time in Palestine. And, and, and you understand the point that he's making. If we as parents, being sinful, know how to give good things to our children, don't you think, and here again is the how much more argument, how much more shall a perfect heavenly father give good gifts to those that ask him? 
That's the character of God. So we see here a lesson about God, but number two, there's a lesson about you. God wants you to know something about yourself. Look again in chapter 18, verse number 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect? Who does he call you? He calls you his elect. You're not a destitute, helpless widow. You're one of God's elect. And this is one of the words in the Scripture that describes a child of God. He calls you his elect because in eternity past, he knew you before you were ever born. He foreknew you. Now, election does not cancel out the responsibility of man. I know that sometimes people, when you mention the word elect, they, they, you know, they don't really understand uh, how divine sovereignty and human responsibility work together. And there's immediately a mystery there. But God, just know this, that in eternity past, God foreknew you. God chose you as one of his own children. Again, that doesn't cancel out your responsibility to obey the gospel because divine sovereignty and human responsibility are together. But just know this, the fact that you came to Jesus Christ is because God already knew in the past that you were going to do that. I kind of liken it to a man who's walking down the street. He's homeless. He sees a big mansion. There's a sign on the front door that says, um, you know, for whosoever will, if you need a place to say, whosoever will. And he says, you know, I'm a whosoever will. And so he opens up the door and he goes into the mansion. He closes the door and he notices a sign on the other side of the door that says chosen from before the foundation of the world. And let me just say this, dear friend. If you come to Jesus Christ, if, if you want salvation, if you want to come to Jesus, if you're, if you're hungry, here's the bread. If you're thirsty, here's the water. If you want Jesus, then you come. And you will not be turned away. But just know this, if you come, God already knew in eternity past, and he saw you in eternity past. And you were one of his elect. And that's what God says. Listen, you're not just anybody. You are my special child. You are one of my special people. And the Bible calls you his beloved. You are his beloved. That's, in fact, the word that's used in Ephesians 1. We are accepted in the beloved. You have any idea how much God loves you, how much he really, really cares deeply about your problems? He loves you so much that um, let me read you a verse of Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 19, verse, or excuse me, chapter 49, verse 14, and through 16 it says this, But Zion saith, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. And here's God's response. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. Thy walls are continually before me. God says, listen, I will never forget you. You are my child. Listen in John 17, verse 23. You know how much God loves you? Listen to John 17, 23. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. God loves you like he loves Jesus. Has loved them, and here Je- and Jesus is praying for us. We are the them there. Has loved them as thou hast loved me. How much does he love you? He loves you like Jesus. Let that think- sink in. You see... He does not love us because we're valuable. We're valuable because he loves us. He doesn't change us so he can love us. He loves us so that he might change us. You are God's special child, and he will not, with a cold heart like this judge, be like a stone wall and not hear you when you come to him. There's a lesson about God. There's a lesson about you. And then finally, what we see here is a lesson about prayer. And what we see here, there's a contrast in the delay in getting an answer. Jesus wants you to know that the reason for God's delay in answering your prayer is not because God needs to be nagged or manipulated, because, again, God's not heartless. He's not uncaring. God's delays in answering prayer are because of timing. Very simply this, dear friend, God is sovereign, and he knows the best time when that prayer needs to be answered. And in the meantime, there are things that God is doing that you have no idea. You see, this unjust judge, he delayed out of selfish indifference, but God never does that. God has a sovereign purpose behind all of his delays, and we have to learn to wait. 
And you know part of the problem? Part of the problem is we're not ready to receive the answer that we asked for. It's like a 10-year-old child coming to his father saying, can I have the keys to the car, Dad? Well, you're not ready to drive just yet. Now, you might get the keys one day, but you're not going to get them today. That's going to come later on in time. And there are certain things that we ask for, and God in his wisdom says, you know what? You're not ready for that just yet. And so we continue to pray. And you know what happens? The prayer helps us because the delay and the continual prayer, what it does is it brings me into fellowship with God continually. And you know what that does? It changes me. God uses prayer to change us, to sanctify us. And in this delay of these things that I'm asking for, I just continue to come to God again and again. And in that coming, I draw closer to the Lord. I learn more about him. And I'll tell you another thing, that delay teaches us persistent. You know what he's doing? He's building us up spiritually. Our prayer doesn't wear God down. Our prayer builds us up. It builds us up spiritually. It builds our spiritual muscle. You see, God's not just a father. He's a coach. And he wants us to finish this race here on this earth strong. You know what? The longer we are in Christ, the more effective and fervent our prayers should grow. As we walk with the Lord, as we seek God, I'm not saying you should have to pray longer, but I I think you can pray better. And we learn more of God's Word. We learn more about ourselves. We learn more about God. And our prayers become more effective. And you know what? By the time this race is almost over, we're not finishing the race, you know, with our hands hanging down and our knees feeble and, you know, not hardly able to finish this race of life. But no, we finish strong. Because we have learned how to continue in prayer, to be persistent in prayer, and we've learned how to trust the Lord God. And that's exactly what God wants. He wants us to learn to continue to pray. And so here the message is, don't stop. Don't lose heart. Just keep coming to God. The formula is simple. Perseverance is produced by persistent prayer. That's how we keep going. That's how we not lose heart. You know how we not lose heart? We bring everything to God in prayer. You ever ever have fears and you just lay them before the Lord? Or you have heartbreaks and burdens and people that you're praying for and things that you want to see happen for the glory of God and you pray for those things and you pray for those things and we just lay it before the throne. And you know what? It builds us. It strengthens us, and it teaches us how to learn to wait on the Lord. We don't lose heart because I'm going to tell you something. When you get on your knees and you bring these things to God, you get off of your knees a whole lot stronger. And God gives us grace just to continue on. We learn to put our hope and our trust in the Lord. And so that's the message here. This is what Jesus said. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Look at that word always. Men ought always to pray. This doesn't mean that you just do it in the morning, you know, you carve out 15 minutes and you pray and then you forget about it the rest of the day. No. If you're a child of God, prayer is like breathing. I don't know about you, but I'm praying all through the day. I'm saying, Lord, help me in this. Or something might come up immediately and I'll pray about that immediately. It should be like breathing to a Christian all throughout the day. We're constantly speaking to God. And coming to God in Jesus' name, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Let me just close with this. While crossing the Atlantic on an ocean liner, the great preacher F.B. Meyer was asked to address the passengers on the subject of answered prayer. He gave a, a great lesson on that to the people there on answered prayer. But there was an agnostic who was present in the service, and when they asked him what he thought of F.B. Meyer's sermon, he basically said, I don't believe a word of it. And later that afternoon, this agnostic was on his way to another service, and so when I asked him again, why are you going to the service? He said, well, I just want to see what this babbler has to say. And he put two oranges in his pocket, and he walked toward the meeting place, and he passed by an elderly woman who was sitting in a chair fast asleep. And in the spirit of fun, he basically took the oranges and put those two oranges in her outstretched palms as she was sleeping in that chair. And after the meeting, on his way back, he saw the old woman eating one of those oranges. 
And he said to her, ma'am, you seem to be really enjoying those oranges, to which she said, yes, my father is very good to me. And he said, well, surely you don't mean your father. I mean, he's, surely he can't be alive still. And she said, oh, no, I'm talking about my heavenly father. He's very much alive. And she went on to say, you see, I've been sitting here, and I've been seasick for a few days, and I asked God to give me an orange to help my seasickness. And she said, while I was praying and asking God for an orange, I suppose I fell asleep. And when I found up, God had not just given me one, he gave me two. And the response of the agnostic, he was speechless. He didn't know what to say. And later on that same cruise, he was converted to Christ, believing that God answers prayer. Let me just encourage you, all right? Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Don't give up. Keep on praying. That's how we not lose heart. Let's bow for prayer together. And so, Father, we are so grateful for the words of our Savior, how that we need to continually come before you, Lord, and to pour out our hearts in prayer and to not give up. Lord, we know that you love us more than we could ever realize. And your delays are not necessarily your denials but you have a perfect plan and a wisdom beyond us. And so, Lord, may we continue just to come to you and pray. And everything that we see that is a burden to us, we bring it to you in prayer, trusting in you. And we know that through that spiritual exercise of prayer, our spiritual muscles are built, and we learn how to walk with you and to trust you even more. So help us to heed the words of our Savior, to always pray, not to lose heart. And we ask all of this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.